Of course, Mary Jo wasn't behind any of the doors and Amy's head was hurting again. This is stupid, Amy whined out loud. Deciding that she was wasting precious time opening doors because Mary Jo was probably on the backside of the game, Amy put her head down and just crawled at super speed toward that area. She'd find Mary Jo there, for sure. To get to the back of the game, Amy had to pass the end of the main corridor. As she did, she glanced toward the entrance to see if anyone was waiting to play. It looked like someone was. The grate was missing, and the entrance was open. Amy started to crawl on, but then she saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Turning, she nearly choked on her sharp inhale. The man she'd seen in the arcade was peering in through the open entrance, and he was looking right at her, oh god. Frozen in mid-crawl, Amy could do nothing but stare at the man who gazed back at her with the same wide grin he'd given Mary Jo in the arcade. The grin dropped Amy's body temperature so fast that she felt like she'd just been flash frozen. Every hair on her body bristled. Amy wasn't sure how long she and the man looked at each other. It felt like forever, but it was probably just a second or two. She didn't seem to be able to move. But when the man stuck his head further in through the game's entrance, a movement that coincided with one particularly loud screech from the game's soundtrack, her body decided it was time to get going. Amy let out a little squeal and started crawling as fast as she could toward the exit. That was it. She'd had enough. Forget minding Mary Jo, Amy just wanted out of the hiding maze. Amy panted heavily and scrabbled noisily as she clawed the first several feet away from the main tunnel, but then she slowed and did her best to control her breathing. Trembling, she looked over her shoulder to see if the man was catching up to her. She didn't see him, but she heard him. At least, she thought she did. Even over the rainforest soundtrack, she could make out a few scuffles and thumps that seemed to be coming from the main tunnel. Forcing herself not to scream in terror, Amy put her head down and started crawling again. By the time Amy was nearing the game exit, she knew more than three minutes had passed. It didn't matter what she did next. Mary Jo would be telling Amy what to do for the rest of the day. As if that was her big problem. As if that was her biggest problem. The truth was that Amy no longer cared what she did later today. She just wanted to get out of the game and get away from the creepy guy. Seeing that creep again was the last straw. Amy didn't want to be anywhere near Freddy's. She wanted to go home. Twisting toward the game's exit, which also exited to the back alley of the building itself, Amy checked over her shoulder to be sure the creepy guy hadn't followed her. She didn't see anything. No one was behind her. Amy pushed the heavy wood door open. When the fresh air hit her, she breathed it in and then exhaled in relief. As she climbed out into the bright afternoon sun though, she paused and looked back at the tunnel. Mary Jo was still in there. What if the creepy guy found her? Amy chewed her lower lip. She frowned. Finally, she shook her head. No, he wouldn't find Mary Jo. She was hidden. It was much more likely he would have found Amy, who was out in the tunnels. Later, Amy would explain to Mary Jo why she left. Mary Jo would understand. So, oh, what is this? What is this? Okay. Stringy hair falling over his dark, evil gaze, the creepy man reaches out and pulls on the cubbyhole handle. The door opens slowly, relentlessly, eventually revealing what it always reveals, Mary Jo, wide-eyed and pale. Launching herself at the man, Mary Jo screams and, and scratches at his bare arms. She's a fighter, and she's not going to let him take her easily. But Mary Jo is no match for the man's strength. He clamps her arms to the sides and drags her from the cubbyhole as Mary Jo screams what she always screams. Amy, Amy, where are you? Help! Why did you leave me? Amy's eyes shot open. She rubbed them with trembling hands as she, re or she, as she reoriented herself to wakefulness. Taking a ragged breath, she realised where she was. She'd been studying, and she'd fallen asleep. For God's sake! Ah. Oh. Even though sun splayed over the beanbag chair where Amy was curled up in the corner of her dorm room, she felt chilled. She always felt chilled after that dream. Amy hugged herself, rubbing her arms to try to warm up. Face it, she thought. You're not going to be able to read today. She never could read on this day. This sunny day in mid-May 
might not have been a day that meant anything good to anyone else, but to Amy this day had great meaning. Just not great as in good. Amy actually hurt, hated this date, and it never passed without her feeling aware of it, from the moment she got up in the morning to the moment she finally fell asleep at night, which generally didn't happen until she'd done a lot of starving at the ceiling and even more tossing and turning. Starring? Staring at the ceiling, sorry. Amy sighed and dropped her book. What was she thinking, trying to read a book on the future of corporate economics on a day like today? Stretching her legs, Amy stood and wandered over to the window that looked out over the quad below. She twirled a few strands of her long hair, watching a couple guys she knew play frisbee. They were good. The disc flew low and straight over the top of a couple dozen sun worshippers and last minute studiers, and it never hit anyone. Amy smiled and took a deep breath. This would be the last week she'd have this view. Graduation was in a week, and three weeks after that she'd be starting the new job she already had lined up. Before she did that though, she was going to have to do something she'd been thinking about doing for a long time. There was no doubt in her mind now. She had to do it, if she ever wanted to be free from her past. She'd carried this weight around for ten years, that was long enough. Turning away from the window, Amy walked over to her neatly made bed. She sat and stared at the bare mattress on the other side of the room. Amy's roommate had finished exams the previous day and she'd already packed up and gone home. Her boyfriend was back home, so she'd planned to spend the week with him, and then return for com uh, commencement. Amy didn't have a boyfriend at home, or here at college for all that matter, and she had two more exams still to take. She just hoped she could concentrate well enough to, screw to not to screw up her grade point average. But Mary Jo might make that possible, uh, impossible, sorry, Mary Jo. Did anyone else ever think about the frizzy haired 11 year old who'd always thought rules were meant to be broken? Probably not. Amy shifted so she could see herself in the full length mirror beside her dresser. She'd seen photos of herself at 11 years old and she didn't think she looked a lot like, a lot different now. She was small and skinny then and she was petite and slender now. Obviously her face looked a little different because she now wore makeup, but the slight slant of her eyes and severe arch of her brows, the upturned nose and the slightly, pout, uh, and the slightly pouty mouth were the same. In the photos she'd seen of her younger self, Amy's long blonde hair had usually been held back in a ponytail or a braid. That was still how she wore her hair. What would Mary Jo look like now? Would her hair still stick out from her head? Would her smile still be as big? Wait, is she dead? Is she actually dead? Oh, I didn't think she was dead. She's actually dead. Oh, God. Huh. At first, Amy liked to tell herself that she never saw Mary Jo again after that day in the hi- Oh, is she missing? Oh, and the, and the hiding maze because Mary Jo got mad and ran away. It was a reasonable conclusion. Mary Jo had often threatened to run away and she'd always had that backpack with her ready to go. But years later, when Amy was being honest with herself, it was pretty clear that Mary Jo hadn't run anywhere. Amy's dream told her that. The reoccurring dream. No, not a dream. Her nightmare had been telling Amy the truth for 10 years. Amy pulled away from her reflection and lay on her bed. She forced herself to travel into the past. As she had done with, as she had done literally thousands of times now, Amy tried to convince herself there was no way she could have known something bad was going to happen to Mary Jo when Amy left the hiding maze. Even though she'd been afraid of the creepy guy, Amy's 11-year-old mind hadn't really believed he found Mary Jo and hurt her. And since then, he, she tried very hard to believe that Mary Jo was never seen again because of something else, something that had nothing to do with what Amy did. But in truth. Amy knew she was, in part, responsible. Just in part, though. The true culprit was the creep Amy had seen in the arcade and at the entrance of the hiding maze right before she left it. The evening of the day she had last seen Mary Jo, Amy had also seen the creep on TV. He'd been arrested for the attempted kidnapping of some other kid. She didn't normally pay attention when her parents watched the news, but she'd seen the guy's face and she'd heard his name, Emmett Tucker, She'd also heard the word kidnapping. When she'd heard that word, her stomach had turned into a rock that dropped all the way to her feet. 
when it was clear Mary Jo had disappeared, Amy just knew that Creep had taken her friend. He'd taken her, he must have killed her. Apparently, the police were never able to prove that he did, so the guy went to prison just for the attempted kidnapping of the other kid. Amy took some comf comfort in that, but not knowing exactly what happened to Mary Jo, ate away at her. For years after Mary Jo disappeared, Amy had carried guilt like a backpack even heavier than Mary Jo's. She had known the creepy guy was poking around the hiding maze and she'd left her friend there. She was sure Emmett Tucker had taken Mary Jo, and it was Amy's fault. Just a few moments after Mary Jo disappeared, Amy and her family had moved to another state. Long before the time they'd left, actually just a couple weeks after the last time Amy saw Mary Jo, the Freddies where Amy and Mary Jo had played in the hiding maze had closed. Amy was never sure why. Her mother thought Freddy was closed because it was inherently unsafe for children. She'd never thought the animatronics were a good idea. Amy's mom was very upset that the town they moved to also had a Freddy's. She didn't have to worry though, Amy never went to it. It reminded her too much of Mary Jo. But last week, her mum had called her, interrupting the cramming Amy was doing for her commercial transactions class. Stepping out of the library and into the cool night to take her mum's call, Amy had looked up at the stars as she said with a sigh, I'm studying, mum. I know you are, sweetie, but I just wanted to check in on you. How's it going? Fine, mum. I do need to concentrate. I know, I know. I just thought you could take a break and chat for a few minutes. Amy's mum's smooth and deep voice broke into a chuckle, <laughs> you know. A few seconds for your dear old mom. Amy sighed. Through the phone, she could hear footsteps tapping on hardwood floors. She could picture her mum pacing back and forth in the kitchen. That's what her mum always did when she was chatting on the phone. Amy could see her mum's lovely face as if she was right there, blonde and blue-eyed like Amy, but with more classical features. Her mum had large eyes, high cheekbones, and a full mouth. Okay, mom, Amy said. What do you want to chat about? You have two minutes. Go. Her mum laughed. Okay, I'll start the kitchen timer. Well, let's see. Your dad is taking up racquetball. He might be too much for him. His shoulders and arms are so sore, he can barely lift his, his coffee cup. Amy smiled. Oh, and I saw a blurb on the news about the man we thought took Mary Jo. Remember him? Remember him? How could she not? Amy felt all of her muscle contract at once, as they always did whenever she thought about Freddy's or Emmett Tucker. What about him? Oh, they let him out of prison, for good behaviour, or some such nonsense. He's back at home, uh, free as a bird, for some reason. I've never forgotten him, probably because of Mary Jo. Amy felt her stomach flip over and tried to cool up her esophagus. She thought she was going to be sick. Mary Jo's kidnapper was free. Amy? Uh, are you there? Hemma asked. Amy tried to talk and the words caught in her throat. She swallowed and managed. Yeah, mum. Has he talked to the press or anything? What? Oh, I have no idea. I just saw a little report about him is all. I have to go, Mom. Amy practically threw the words at her mother, and she didn't wait for a response. She ran inside the library, straight to the bathroom, where she threw up. After sitting in the bathroom stool and crying for half an hour, she'd forced herself not to think about what her mum had told her. She had to study and take an exam. But of course, she'd thought about it. She'd been thinking about it for a week now. Even so, she'd made sure it didn't mess up her studying because before she went back to cramming her, the night her mum called, she made a decision. As soon as she graduated, she was going back to the town where she spent the first 11 years of her life. She was going back, and she was going to find out what Emmett Tucker did with Mary Jo. Let's go, Amy. 10 years of uncertainty couldn't turn into 15 or 20 or more. Amy could no longer live with the assumption that Mary Jo had been kidnapped by Tucker without proving that he really did kidnap her and finding out what he did to her friend. She needed to know where he put Mary Jo's body. It's going to be in one of the cubby holes in, a, in the hide and seek game, right? Right? Oh god. Amy was tired of the nightmares and the horrible visions that played over and over and over in her head. She was also tired of trying to delude herself with the idea that Mary Jo had run off and was living happily ever after somewhere. She was going to discover and prove the truth once and for all. Amy remembered her hometown as a pretty little place. Hugging both sides of a river uh, that flowed out of the nearby mountains, the town was the home of a billionaire who had built his corporation's headquarters here. 
The headquarters, designed to look like an old-time western town, sprawled along the river on one end of the town. That's where both Amy's parents had worked. When the billionaire had a new complex with a more d modern design, built a few states away, probably so he could have a warmer place to visit in the winter, her parents were transferred. Amy had never really grown to like the new state, too hot for her, and she missed snow in the winters. If it wasn't for Mary Jo, or actually the absence of Mary Jo, Amy would pr probably have applied for a job at the corporate headquarters here in her old hometown, but she knew she couldn't handle living in a place that would remind her of her friend every day. Instead, she'd taken a job in a town a couple hundred miles from here. It had the same climate, but no painful memories. Amy pulled her cute little red hybrid compact into the parking lot of the Riverside Motel just before sunset. When she turned off the engine, she tapped the steering wheel a couple times. Should she now go, or wait until tomorrow? She squinted up beyond the motel's redwood siding and river rock covered uh, pillars. A reddish sun was sinking toward the glacier-topped ridge to the west. Almost blood-red rays painted the white expanses. Amy shivered. Tomorrow. What she needed to do could definitely wait until tomorrow. Amy looked away from the sunset. She turned and grabbed a bright yellow sweater from the back seat. Slipping it on, she picked up her purse and got out of the car. It took Amy only minutes to check into the motel and find her room. Once there, she perched atop the beige coverlet on the queen-sized bed. She was facing a mirror above the low pine dresser sitting against the exposed log wall opposite the end of the bed. Well, here you are, she said to herself. The mirror vision of Amy spoke at the same time she did, of course. Still, she had trouble recognising herself. She looked older in this mirror, like she was pushing 40 instead of barely getting to know 21. Why did her complexion look so grey, her cheeks so gaunt? Amy raised a hand to her face and brushed a few strands of hair from her eyes. It felt like a stranger was touching her. How odd. A tremor skittered down Amy's spine and she looked away from the mirror. She needed sleep, was all. She'd studied hard for most of four weeks, and over the last three days, she'd partied just as hard. Amy didn't have a ton of friends, but the ones she had were close ones. One of them, Greta, was Amy's closest friend since Mary Jo. She had super wealthy parents and lived in a mansion with a pool, tennis courts, a huge movie room, an equally large game room, and a massive ballroom. After exams were over, Greta's parents threw Greta and her, fr and her friends a three-day party, complete with live music and food catered by the best chef in town. Greta and Amy had spent much of that time alone in the movie room binge-watching binge old romantic comedies. They both loved the quiet solitude, but they'd balanced it with plenty of swimming, dancing and eating. Amy had been friends with Greta since she and her parents had moved to the new state. She'd gone to junior high, high school, and college with Greta. Greta was the opposite of Mary Jo, a much better match for Amy than Mary Jo ever was. When Amy had met Greta, she'd realised that her mother's theory about friendship and balance had been a bunch of crap. Amy and Mary Jo hadn't been friends because they balanced each other out. They'd been friends because Amy had been too shy to tell Mary Jo to go jump in the river. Oh my god. <laughs> Mary Jo had decided they were best friends and Amy had gone along with it. From that point on, Everything had been all about Mary Jo. As long as they were together, they were doing what Mary Jo wanted. The only time Amy had gotten to be herself had been when she was literally by herself. Greta had been the person who had helped Amy figure this out. Greta had just graduated with a BA in psychology and she was going on to get a master's next. She wanted to be a therapist. Amy was one of her unofficial pr uh, practice patients. Just the day before, there's as they floated in Greta's parents' infinity pool, looking out over perfectly trimmed expansive of green lawn and pruned bushes, Greta had said, You realise that you don't need to find out exactly what happened to Mary Jo to get closure, right? Amy, who had been sipping lemonade from a huge covered tumbler, balanced on her flat belly, uh, shook her head and smacked her lips at the tartness of her drink. Yes, I do. Greta shook her head full of short curls. A stunning red-headed beauty with flawless pale skin, green eyes and model-worthy features, Greta was surprisingly unconcerned about her looks. She rarely wore makeup and she cut her own hair, despite being able to afford the most expensive hairdresser in town. 
She wasn't particularly good at hair cutting, so her curls were always asymmetrical. No, you don't, Greta said. The only thing you need to do is forgive yourself. That's it. Easy peasy. One step. The end. Amy shook her head, and Greta splashed water on her. Amy closed her eyes just in time, and after the water cascaded over her sweaty shoulders and arms, she kept her eyes closed. With her sight taking a mini vacation, Amy's other senses stepped up. She could smell Greta's coconut-scented sunscreen, the lemon in her own lemonade, and the chlorine in the water. She could hear the water too. It lapped lazily against their floating lounges and splashed against the sides of the pool. From the tennis courts, the thwack of rackets hitting tennis balls drifted over. From even further away, the soothing sound of horses' neighs reached Amy's ears from the pastures. Amy took a deep breath, inhaling all this peacefulness. Then she said, It's not as easy as you say it is. Mary Jo is missing because I left her in that game. I didn't warn her. I didn't tell her an adult. I didn't tell an adult. I just left her right where that man could take her. Greta smacked the water with her hand. The sh sharp sound made Amy flinch and open her eyes. God, you're so stubborn. How many times do I need to tell you that you don't know that? Greta asked. You're not dumb enough to think that. You don't know what happened after you left. You don't know what she did after she left the game. Probably some choice Mary Jo made led to her disappearance. Your choice had nothing to do with it. But Emmett Tucker, Amy began. Greta held up a hand. Tucker Schmucker, you don't know for sure that he took Mary Jo and neither did the police. And if he didn't take her, then why is Mary Jo's disappearance your fault? I mean, I get it. I, you feel like your choice was responsible because it was such a huge deal for you. It's not Mary Jo's disappearance that marks that day for you. It's your standing up for yourself that makes the day so important. That was the first time you defied her, right? That's what you've always told me. Amy nodded. She and Greta had been through all this many times, but Greta was right. Amy was stubborn. It was hard to disconnect her act of defiance with the end of Mary Jo, and therefore it was hard not to blame herself for Mary Jo's disappearance. But I, I didn't really defy her, Amy said. Not directly, anyway. Greta opened her mouth, and this time, Amy held up her hand. You make it sound like I was making this big, self-empowering statement that day I left her in the game, but the truth is, I was just being a scared, petulant child. I mean... If I was going to actually stand up to Mary Jo, I would have told her no. I would have said, I don't want to play in the hiding maze. I'm going home to read. I didn't do that. Instead, I did something that left her vulnerable. And now that Emmett Tucker is out of prison, she shrugged, because of that, you're filling your head with horrible images, imagining what he might have done to your friend, and you're heaping even more guilt on yourself. I know that the day you took your stand with Mary Jo was passive aggressive, but you need to cut yourself some slack. You were 11 years old. Psychology, psychological mastery isn't a requirement for that age. Greta winked at Amy, and Amy smiled. You're a good friend, Amy said. So are you. And you were a good friend to Mary Jo. You owe her nothing. Amy twisted her lips. Greta sighed. But you're still going back, Amy nodded. I have to. I, I really do have to. Greta was quiet for several seconds. Inside the house, the band started playing again. So much for peacefulness. The bass was so strong, it vibrated the surface of the water in the pool. I could still go with you. I meant it when I said I'd be happy to come. Greta shouted over a screeching guitar riff. I know, but I need to do this by myself. In her motel room, Amy lay back on her bed as the image of her friend and the relaxing pool faded away. Now that she was here, she was really wishing Greta had come with her would have been so much easier with Greta along, maybe even fun. They could have turned it into a celebration of everything they had to look forward to in the coming years. They could have... Amy frowned and derailed that train of thought. This trip wasn't about having fun or celebrating, it was about finding out once and for all what exactly had happened to Mary Jo. Amy hadn't told her parents or Greta exactly what she was planning to do, Amy knew that they would have tried to talk her out of it. She could just hear her mother telling her how dangerous the idea was. But Amy didn't think it was all that dangerous. Well, maybe a little. But she thought she could handle it. Sure, when Amy had been a little girl, Tucker was scary. But now, Amy was more than capable of handling herself. 
She was strong and athletic, and she'd taken self-defense classes. Plus, she had both mace and a pretty blue taser in her purse. And she had her determination. She was going to find out what Tucker did, one way or another. Besides, Tucker was more than likely a wuss. He took little kids, not adults. He wouldn't know what to do with someone who could fight back. Or at least that was what Amy told herself as she headed to Bernadette's bakery on Main Street. Before Amy came back to face Emmett Tucker, she read the newspaper article about his release. The article had featured a photo of Tucker sitting in front of Bernadette's bakery. A little research had revealed that through the bake that though the bakery served tourists and locals alike, it was a favourite of long-time residents. Hoping Tucker was a regular, Amy figured the bakery was a good place to start um, her search for him. Bernadette's was one of a couple dozen long-established businesses in the heart of town. The little downtown area was built around a brick-covered square with a stone fountain and a rose garden, and Bernadette's was the shop closest to the fountain. Amy found a parking space two doors down from Bernadette's and got out of her car. Slipping her long purse strap over her head so the purse hung across her body, she pulled her sweater tight and headed toward Bernadette's pale yellow storefront. Several pigeons strutted back and forth in front of Bernadette's, snatching pastry crumbs from under the little metal tables on the patio. It was chilly this morning, and only a couple old guys sat at the tables. When Amy had arrived in town the previous evening, the sun had been setting in a clear sky. Today, the sun was taking a little vacation. A froth of grey clouds churned above the town like the balloons that had floated on the ceiling of Greta's family's ballroom a couple days before. Those balloons, though, had been purple, not grey, and they'd promised happy times. The clouds overhead didn't seem to promise anything good. For some reason, Amy found them ominous. Get a grip, she muttered to herself as she pulled open the bakery's bright blue door. Bernadette's interior, thankfully, was warm, and it smelled of cinnamon, sugar, and coffee. Cramped and cute and frilly, the place didn't strike Amy as one that would appeal to the likes of Emmett Tucker. She looked around to see if he was here. He wasn't, but she figured she might as well hang out a bit and see if she and see if he showed up. The bakery's half dozen rickety wood tables were occupied mostly by played attired locals, but a few stylishly dressed tourists were in the mix. Every table seat was taken, but a tall counter along one wall had a couple empty stools. Amy approached the service counter and waited behind a tall woman, ordering three dozen assorted pastries. While she waited, Amy turned and watched out of the window, her muscles tensed, her gaze darting around, scanning the street for Emmett Tucker. Tucker didn't show up while Amy, Amy watched, but he did eventually appear. Amy had been nursing a small latte and nibbling on a cinnamon roll for ten minutes, wondering if she was wasting her time. Maybe she should have gone to the country records office and tried to find Tucker's residence. She was glancing at her watch for the fifth time when Bernadette's door swung open, and Emmett Tucker walked in. Amy knew Emmett Tucker had been in his early forties when he was arrested. He looked much older than that, but several things contributed to the wrinkles that had kinch kinched up his face. <laughs> He'd apparently spent most of his adult life working outside on construction sites, and he, was, he also was a chain smoker. Amy figured he probably ate junk food too. He didn't look like someone who bought organic vegetables. Now with his long hair gone, replaced by a buzz cut, Tucker was barely recognisable as the man he'd been when Amy had seen him at Freddy's and on the news. But she knew him. Those eyes and those yellow teeth were unmistakable. Sometime in the last ten years, Tucker had picked up a scar that bisected his left cheek, and he'd lost, mo and he'd lost a few of his teeth. No one greeted Tucker when he came into the bakery. The tourist didn't give him a glance. The locals flicks, flicked looks at him, but they quickly returned their attention to their coffee and rolls. Tucker didn't seem to care one way or another about who was paying attention to him. He just ordered his coffee and cinnamon roll and headed back outside. Amy half rose um, off her stool when he went out the door, but she sat down when Tucker settled himself at an outside table and proceeded to drink his coffee and eat a cinnamon roll as if it was a warm sunny day. For 20 minutes, Amy tapped her foot and sipped at the dregs of her cooling latte. Should she confront him now? 
that would probably be smart. But then again, maybe if she just followed him, she'd learn something about him that would make a confrontation unnecessary. She gritted her teeth. She should wait. When Tucker finally rose from his table, Amy stood and dropped her styrofoam cup and paper plate in a trash bin by the door as she watched Tucker head north up the street. Before he could get out of sight, she exited the bakery and lingered by its tables as she watched Tucker angle off the sidewalk toward the driver's side of an old, faded green van. A van. That was suspicious. Didn't kidnappers use vans? Amy trotted carefully, uh, sorry, Amy trotted quickly to her car and got in just as Tucker backed the van out of the angled parking spot in front of an art gallery. She quickly started her car and pulled out to follow him. For the next hour, Amy tailed Tucker to a pharmacy where he picked up a prescription, to a gas station where he put gas in the van, and finally to a grocery store where he filled a cart with frozen dinners, chips, canned soup, cereal and a gallon of milk. She was right about his lack of interest in organic vegetables. He didn't go anywhere near the produce aisle, period. Amy's heart rate had been fast and uneven when she'd started stalking her quarry, but by the time she had got to the grocery store, it had settled down. It turned out the stalking wasn't all that interesting, at least not when your target was doing mundane things. It wasn't hard, either. At first, Amy had been furtive. At the pharmacy, she had hidden behind a display of sunglasses, and she had even pretended to try on a few pairs so she'd have a disguise. At the gas station, she had pulled her car in behind a dumpster and gotten out to peer over the top of it while Tucker had pumped his gas. In the grocery store, at first, she hid behind product displays at the end of the aisles. But when it became obvious that Tucker was oblivious to her surroundings, she gave up the subterfuge and just followed him around. She did have a cart, so she looked like a normal shopper, and she threw a little of this and that uh, in the cart. But she shouldn't have bothered. He never even looked her way. After Tucker got back in his van in the grocery store parking lot, she, uh, he headed out of town and turned onto a narrow rural road. He le she let a car get between her and Tucker just in case he'd noticed her, not that she thought he would. The town was filled with small hybrids similar to hers. As she drove, Amy kept her gaze on the roof of the van up ahead of her. It trundled along at a sedate pace, so it was easy to keep up. At one point, a loud caw startled her, and she flinched when a crow swooped low across the hood of her car, barely avoiding her windshield. Rattled for reasons she didn't understand, she watched the crow fly up over a dormant uh, cornfield, not cornfield, 